All right, so <clears throat> welcome to our presentation on Google's Chrome developer tools. Um, so this is a kind of more generic uh, talk about how to work with the browser and as a web developer. Um, it is not necessarily WordPress specific, but it's also something that if you're a WordPress developer, um, you should be using these tools on a regular basis as part of your uh, work, um, just because obviously everything we do is going to involve the browser in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so knowing your way around it and knowing how to investigate and debug and do all these different types of things um, are going to be pretty important. So um, I'm Micah Wood, um, WP Scholar online. So if you just Google WP Scholar, you'll find me. Um, and we are going to jump in here. Let's see. There we go. Whoop. That was, there we go. All right. So we have uh, kind of a few different ways to open up the Google um, developer tools. So one of the easiest ways is to go to the little dot, dot, dot uh, nav menu item and drop down to the more tools section. And then there is a developer tools uh, menu item there. So that's kind of the, the manual way of going about getting there. Uh, you can also just right click anywhere in um, the web page and it will give you a uh, little drop down like this and there will be an inspect section. And so that inspect uh, will also open up the developer tools um, and it will it'll, it'll highlight whatever element you clicked on to inspect um, as well. The other thing it will do, um, oh yeah, that's an example there. So if I right clicked on the, uh, the Google uh, image there, it would highlight that uh, particular image down here on the bottom. <clears throat> All right, so whoop, sorry, my screen keeps losing focus from people coming in the room. <laughs> um, so there's a, you can also use shortcuts to open up the Chrome developer tools. This is typically how I do it, just because I like to keep my hands on the keyboard as much as possible. <clears throat> um, but on a Mac, you can hit Command, Option, and then I, and that will open the developer tools there. On Windows, uh, just so you know, all the shortcuts that I'm going to mention from here on, on out are all going to be Mac shortcuts, but you could basically substitute command with control and um, for, for pretty much all the other shortcuts, and uh, it should be basically the same. Uh, but in this case, if you're on Windows, uh, the shortcuts are different here. So control shift I is kind of the long form one, but it's way easier just to hit F12 if you're on a Windows machine. So <clears throat> what I'd recommend you do is, um, you know, especially if you have two screens or if you can do a split screen, you know, while you're watching this presentation, go ahead and open up the uh, uh, developer tools and kind of toy around and play around and uh, see uh, how things work as we go through. So we'll, we're gonna start out with some basic stuff that, um, you know, as a beginner developer, uh, you may not be aware of, but as a more advanced developer, you probably will. And we'll work our way into more advanced things as we go. Um, so don't think this is going to be too basic or too advanced. We're going to work our way up. Um, but even the advanced parts, I think, for newer developers are still just as useful. So, um, <clears throat> so we've kind of sectioned this out into different use cases. So the first use case is we have HTML, right? All web pages have HTML and we've got to work with it every day, right? So WordPress outputs your HTML and we're going to figure out how do we manipulate it in the browser to uh, test things without necessarily having to go edit a theme file, um, you know, to see if what we want to do is going to work. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, you can right click and hit inspect and that'll pop open the dev tools. Um, I like to have it on the right hand side, there's a little dock icon where you can dock it to the top or bottom or even a separate window. Um, but this is kind of my typical preferred layout. Um, so <clears throat> the element selector, um, you know, when you hover over, uh, so if you, there's a little 
icon here, you can click. And then as you hover over things on the page, it will highlight them like it does here and show you a little bit of information. And it'll also highlight it in the um, markup. So it'll expand the markup to wherever that element is. Uh, so if you're just trying to navigate around and see what's what, uh, that's an easy way just to click that little icon there uh, in the top left of the developer tools. And then you can hover over things and see um, see properties and, and, and markup and all that kind of good stuff. So um, once you um, kind of find your way around, um, another way of navigating the, uh, the DOM, the HTML um, in the window here, uh, is to use the arrow keys. So if you um, if you use the up or down arrow, it'll move to the previous or next element, um, and the left and right will expand and collapse. So you know if you have uh, an element that you can expand, you can hit the right arrow, and then you can go into the child by moving down. Or if um, you know an element's collapsed and you hit down, it'll take you to the sibling. Um, so that's the difference with the down arrow there, but um, very nice shortcuts to be able to kind of navigate around a little bit with the keyboard. Like I said, I like to use the keyboard a lot. Um, <clears throat> you can also hit uh, Command F, and this will pull up the um, the search bar. Uh, so you can type text into the search bar, and it will actually search the HTML to find that text. So you can search for you know text inside of an element. You can search for a class name. You can search for an ID. Um, you can search for all, all kinds of stuff. So it's just important to be aware that, you know, while you can do Command F, if you have focus on the left-hand side of the screen, um, that'll just search the text that you see on the page. When you do that Command F in the Elements panel, uh, that will actually search the HTML. Um, so once you're looking at an element in the Elements panel, you can right-click on it and hit edit attribute. And that will let you edit um, whatever attribute that uh, that you clicked on, right? So if it was a class name or an href, or in this case, a target, um, you could edit that. Um, you can also just double click and that will allow you to edit that particular attribute as well. And then you can always um, select an element and hit edit as HTML. And what that's going to do is it's going to um, basically turn that markup into an editable area where you can edit the HTML markup for that. And then, um, <clears throat> so if you needed to, for example, inject an element onto the page or, to, or something like that, you could actually just manually type it in, see kind of what it's going to look like. And then, you know, if you need to go edit a WordPress template or something um, after that test passes, then you can, um, you know, just copy it from, from the elements panel. Uh, so sometimes you might want to move elements around just to, uh, to see how things might affect layouts or things like that. And again, we're kind of using the Google homepage as our playground here. But um, so these uh, elements here, this list of elements on the right, corresponds to all of the essentially entries over here on the left. So you can see we have one highlighted and that highlights this guy here. Um, you can actually use Command F or Control F on Windows uh, and hit the up or down arrow keys and it will swap those elements um, as, as you go down the page. So you're basically moving that element down or that element up. Um, <clears throat> so, not, I don't use it super often, but it is handy to know about. Um, you can also duplicate an element. So for example, let's say you have uh, a page with, you know, maybe a, it's displaying a list of posts, but you want to see what it looks like if there's, I don't know, three more or something. You can actually duplicate an element um, by right-clicking on a given element and hitting that duplicate button. And likewise, you could do the same if you want to remove one. You can right-click and hit delete, and that will delete that particular element. And again, all of these changes that you're making are just within the browser. And if you reloaded the page, all those changes you make will go away. So this is more of just how do you test your HTML and, and just you know make sure you get it right in the browser before you go editing template files. 
Um, <clears throat> so the other kind of use case we have obviously is CSS. So there's a lot of style sheets um, you might be working with in WordPress. Um, so we're going to kind of see how we can how we can identify you know where styles are coming from and where we need to go to change them. Um, you know, do they belong to a plugin? Do they belong to a theme? Um, so <clears throat> whatever element you click on in the elements panel, that little uh, styles panel that's off to the right there uh, will show you the specific styles associated with that element. Um, and there will be a lot of different types of selectors that may be used to target that element in your CSS. And there may be a lot of different files um, that have rules associated with that. Um, <clears throat> So there is a way to, um, yeah, I just saw the question. Um, once you edit in the browser, can you then save the changes you made? Um, typically, if you edit in the browser, it's just temporary and you reload the page and it's gone. Uh, but we do have some more advanced tips and tricks later where you can actually persist these changes directly to the files that you are working with in WordPress. And then um, you can literally just do stuff in the browser and it saves it for you. Um, in your project. So <clears throat> we'll talk about that here in a little bit more. Um, the, let's see, as far as font size, I just saw that other question. Um, you can manipulate the styles here to change the um, font sizes. Uh, so for this particular link element, for example, you could manipulate the, um, uh, the rules here uh, or even add a new one that says, you know, font size 32 pixels, whereas, you know, like this here says 14, you could update that. <clears throat> um, so you can view all the styles um, over here on the right. And then hovering over any given style is going to reveal a little checkbox. And you can use that checkbox to toggle that particular style off and on. This is very helpful when you're debugging and trying to say, okay, well, you know, I got some weird style issue going on and you want to kind of toggle things on and off and see what might be affecting that particular element. Um, so easy to just toggle those things on and off. Um, the other thing you can do is directly manipulate the value of a CSS rule. So in this case, we have margin left eight pixels. Um, <clears throat> and you could just double click on eight pixels and it makes it editable and you can change it. Uh, the up and down arrows will increment by one and it'll keep the pixel value. So if I hit the up arrow, it would take me to nine pixels, if it down, it would take me to seven pixels. But there's also a couple of other um, shortcuts that you can use to increment in different ways. So, uh, so let's say you wanted to move an element uh, by, I don't know, changing the margin or something, um, you or the width or the height or whatever. Um, you can actually hit command and then the up or down arrow to increment or decrement by 100. Uh, so that's helpful if you're trying to move something up the page, down the page, make it significantly bigger or smaller. Um, if you have uh, some smaller value, maybe you're just trying to uh, change a text size for a heading, you can bump up and down by 10 if you use the shift plus the arrow key. And then if you're maybe dealing with something like rims or m's and you want to have a much smaller value you don't even even incrementing by one might be too much uh, you can use the option and then up and down arrow keys to increment by a tenth um, so very helpful to um, to be aware of that um, <clears throat> here is another super cool tip so a lot of times you go and you make a bunch of changes and you're like aha i figured out if i edit this element and that element and that element styles um, it fixes my issue. So now I need to take whatever I've done in the browser, I need to apply it into my um, project. So one easy way of just saying, hey, what are the changes that I've made in the browser? Um, you can go to the little um, drop-down menu, the dot, dot, dot menu in the top right, um, but, but not the one. There's two dot, dot, dot menus. Uh, so you'll see there's one here uh, at the level of the address bar, and there's another one here at the level of the um, panel where the dev tools is so you'll hit the you'll hit the one inside the dev tools um and so you'll hit more tools and you go to changes and what that's going to do is pop up this little window down here and any changes that you've made here are all highlighted in a single um 
place here and it tells you what file it's associated with. So if you've made changes across, say, styles that were coming in from three different files, those three files would show here and the changes that were applied uh, to each of those. Um, so the other thing you can do is filter by styles. So if you're, again, maybe you're trying to figure out, uh, I don't know, um, uh, what elements on the page have Z index or something like that. You can actually type Z index or, you know, whatever CSS rule you want, and that will filter the list of what you see in this styles panel. So as you navigate the DOM or whatever, you can see um, specifically the thing that you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> There's also a computed section. So that little styles panel, there, there's a tab over called computed. Uh, it actually has this little nice image. It gives you an idea of like, okay, so the element that you have highlighted is X wide by X tall. It has X amount of padding, X amount of border, X amount of margin. And you can even double click inside of the, um, the values in here and change them directly. Um, but this section here in the middle is the um, list of actual computed values. So you can actually, you know, there could be 15 rules that are affecting a particular element, right? And they all might be trying to give different font sizes, but only one of those rules is actually going to override and be the one that's in use, right? So you can you can actually expand a particular um, uh, property and it'll show you the list of things. And then when you hover over, it gives you this little arrow icon. It's like a circle. If you click on that, that jumps you to the actually, um, the, I guess the winning rule, I should say, in the styles panel so that you can see <clears throat> uh, exactly what uh, is being applied to that element. And, and of course it tells you here in the list to the top of the list, um, you know, it was, there's one rule that made it bold, and there's this other rule that made it 500. Um, uh, if we have time at the end, I can do a live demo, um, but we there is a lot of stuff in this, so it's very possible that <laughs> uh, we, we might not have time. Um, but, oh, yeah, yeah. There's the text size hint. Command plus will increase the text size. Um, all right, so... The other thing you could do is toggle class names. So uh, if you click in an element and you're in the styles panel here, there's a .cls, and that basically will show you a list of all the class names with little toggle check icons uh, next to each uh, class name. So if you uncheck it, it removes that class from the element. Um, so if you're working with, oh, I don't know, something like Tailwind or some other you know, CSS framework, uh, a lot of these classes get used and they have very specific things that they do. Uh, and sometimes you want to remove some of those just to see if that fixes an issue. Other times you want to add them. So you can also click in the little add section and then type a new class name and then hit enter and it'll add it to this checkbox list. Um, and it'll also, as you type, if that uh, even before you hit enter to add it to the checkbox list, uh, it affects the element immediately, so you can see the results as you type. Um, <clears throat> you can also add custom rules. So if you have an element selected and you hit the uh, the little plus button next to the CLS that we were just using, um, it will actually add a new rule for you automatically. Um, in this case, you know Google's got some interesting uh, class names and stuff here, but uh, you can't. It'll Auto populate this, and you can you can manipulate that. Um, you know, it highlights it for you right after you hit the plus button. So if you wanted to tweak it, you could do that, and then you can click in here and add whatever rules that you'd like. Um, and again, yeah, just that tip I mentioned earlier. If you double click on the uh, uh, what do they call it, this little box model, um, you can actually edit the values associated with that directly. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, sorry, the, uh, the screenshots I have in here, they may, depending on the resolution of your computer, it may be hard to see, but there's not really an easy way to zoom in. Um, but I will share the, um, the slide deck, um, uh, on the meetup, uh, page. So after the fact, you can always go back and, and look at all this. So hopefully it'll be 
more visible. Um, so let's see. Yep. So you can edit those. And then um, the other cool thing is that you can actually force element state. So for example, if you're working on a WordPress menu and um, you know you need to make sure that you force the hover state on an element so you can see the styles associated with the drop down or whatever that may be. Um, you can actually uh, right click on the element in the elements panel, gives you this little drop down. You hover over force state and it gives you all the different states that could be associated with that element. So in this case, it's a link. So you'll have the active state, the hover state, the focus state, the visited state, <laughs> um, all those things that sometimes you forget to style when you're working with CSS. Um, you can force a given state and then investigate the styles and manipulate those and then tweak them in your in your theme. Um, so the other thing is a lot of times we, <laughs> uh, I know I, I, as a developer, I've worked with designers who have such an eye for their designs and the fonts and things that are used that a lot of times we'll have two fonts that are so similar, I can't tell the difference. But the designer's like, that's the wrong font. Um, and so I have to verify, um, you know, what the font is, right? So you can actually click an element, go to the computed panel, and then down here at the bottom, it will tell you what the rendered font is. So in this case, it's Helvetica. Um, but obviously, if you had some other font that you were trying to use, it would um, it would show you what's in use, and you can obviously determine if that's the one you intend or not. Uh, so it just gives you an easy way to double check that. Um, the other thing is that you can emulate a uh, print media, right? So if someone were to print out your web page, for example, um, you know, not everybody does this, but you know, if you're creating a theme that's going to be publicly released, you might want to have a print style sheet so that if somebody tries to print pages, um, they look nice and don't get all weird with uh, <laughs> the way that they work. Um, so you can go to the more tools, go to rendering, and there's this little section here called emulate CSS media type, and you can go to print and it will, um, it'll actually change what you see on the left-hand side uh, to be what you would get if you were to print the page. Um, one of the things that a lot of people will add in a print style sheet is links are very difficult when you print them out because you don't get the URL, right? So you only get the text. So you can actually add a CSS rule that will show the HTML or the, uh, uh, the link after the text. Um, so a lot of people do that in their print media. So working with JavaScript. Uh, so JavaScript is another um, common thing that everyone who is a developer works with. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to kind of take a quick look at what does it take to um, to do debugging in the browser. So unlike backend debugging, like you would do if you had PHP files. Um, you know, where you'd have to set up all kinds of stuff to get the debugging working. Chrome Developer Tools has it ready to go. And all you got to do is, um, you know, open up the developer tools, um, set your breakpoint in whatever file um, that you want. And then, um, so, well, so you open up the dev tools, you go to the sources tab. So there's the sources tab up here. Uh, and that shows you all the files that are loaded. So in this case, we're we're clicking on um, this get it get started JS file, and then uh, we're finding inside the file, you know, the line of code that we want to uh, stop at, and then um, and then we'll do whatever we need to on the left hand side over here to trigger the code to run to that point. And that may not be clicking on something; it could just be reloading the page, and then the browser would stop there. So this little panel off to the right of, uh, of this is the debug panel. So there's some buttons up here. One is going to um, resume the code. Uh, there's one that will actually step you into the next line of code or step over the next line of code. Uh, or, you know, there's some ways to kind of navigate in and out of functions. Um, <clears throat> so. If you haven't used that before, um, I recommend just playing around with it. 
uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, the slide deck does have a link to um, a guide from Google on how to use this uh, better. Uh, so if you're interested in this, there is a whole kind of tutorial you can follow for this. Um, but it is cool because you can see um, uh, variables that are scoped to the window versus the function versus uh, you know whatever uh, your code is doing. Um, another thing, you know, when you're working with JavaScript, uh, a lot of times files get minified. And so when the files are minified, uh, they, they're really, really hard to read, right? Like there's just this, everything's mashed together. And, you know, uh, a lot of times names of things are replaced with letters, which is not very helpful. But uh, at a minimum, you can click this little uh, double brace um, button down here in the bottom left when you're looking at a file and that will format it for you. So even though some of it still might not make the most sense, uh, if you're trying to set a breakpoint or something like that, um, it can be very helpful to kind of see what all's going on there and where you might need to do that. <clears throat> um, if you click an element in the elements panel uh, and you have the console, so the console down here at the bottom, you can hit escape. Um, and that will toggle on and off the little console window at the bottom. Um, so if you're on the elements panel and you hit escape, it'll pull up this console. You if you click an element and then you type dollar sign zero in the console, it, it's basically referencing the element that you last clicked. So if you click another element, you do dollar sign zero, it's going to be whatever that is that you clicked on. Um, <clears throat> so this is very helpful if you're trying to test out some JavaScript and you want to make sure that, um, you, you know, you want to spend more time focused on the code that you're trying to work with and not trying to select the right DOM element, right? So it gives you just a quick shortcut to say, hey, here's this thing. I want to manipulate it and see if this code is going to work. And technically, there's a dollar sign one and a dollar sign two. So if you want to reference things in whatever order you clicked on them, <laughs> Uh, zero is the first, one is the second, and so on. Um, so there's also this really cool feature here, um, you know, because a lot of times if you're working in the JavaScript console, you can type a line of code, but you can't type a whole function. So it's kind of hard to work with something where you're trying to test a, a decent sized chunk of code. Um, but you can go to the sources panel. And then over here on the left, uh, normally it lists all the, the files and stuff. Uh, you can click on snippets and you may have, there's like a little double arrow thing that may list out some other things. So it may be hidden, but um, when you click on snippets, you can actually add a new snippet and it basically creates a JavaScript file that you can just type whatever you want into. And then when you, um, you know, you right click on it, which I think, I, yeah, here we go. Um, so when you right click on it, you can actually run it and it'll run it in the console. Um, well, if you have a console log, it'll pull it up and show you that, but it'll also do whatever in the browser window here as well. Um, so we can have both going on in this situation, but you can type code, run it, um, and these snippets actually persist across browser sessions. So you can close your browser down and go to a different page and run the same snippet on another page. Um, so it's actually kind of helpful there's a lot of cool little snippets that other people have created, <clears throat> which can do all kinds of cool stuff, like help you diagnose uh, SEO issues on a page, or you know, there's a lot of creative things out there. Um, but snippets are really helpful, um, a great way to explore JavaScript in the browser without necessarily having, you know, especially if you're trying to learn new stuff. Um, it's a great way to to just test things. Uh, so dealing with, uh, you know, the responsive nature of, you know, WordPress themes, um, <clears throat> you always want to make sure, obviously, that you do a lot of testing to make sure things work on desktop, things work on mobile, things work on tablet. Um, and so you can actually click this little device toolbar button, which is the second icon from the left, top left in the dev tools. And this will pull up <clears throat> uh, what they call responsive mode. And I'm going to use some water here. <clears throat> and um, 
So you can actually manually edit the, uh, the numbers here to change the width or height of the viewport. It also gives you these little handlebars on the left and the bottom where you can kind of resize. Um, <clears throat> and then you can also use this little drop down here to select a specific um, element or uh, not element, a uh, device. So Pixel 5, iPhone XR, uh, you know, all kinds of different devices in here. And then uh, it'll auto resize everything to that uh, to that size. And even if you reload the page, what'll happen is it'll it'll use the proper uh, uh, what you call it um, user agent, and it'll emulate tapping instead of clicking and stuff like that as well. Uh, it's not a perfect you, you know it's not the, actually the same as using the device itself, but it is pretty close. And so it's really good for testing. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we work a lot with in um, web development is the actual requests that are happening between, you know, the server and the client. So we want to, a lot of times we might want to do some performance uh, optimization, or we just want to kind of see um, what all's going on. There is a network tab. And this will list all of the HTTP requests that happen for a given page load. Um, and so by default, it just shows you everything here. It's just a list of files and whatever the status code is and some other details as well. <clears throat> but you can also filter by type. So in this case, we're filtering to see all the JavaScript files. And so down here on the bottom, it tells me there that six out of the 41 requests which are the ones that are highlighted here are JavaScript. Um, so um, <clears throat> you can also filter by status code. So if you have some specific status code, maybe you're looking for anything that's 404ing or redirecting or something like that, you can actually filter the list of requests by that. Um, so there's a lot of different things you could search by that this list here, you know, searching by name or path, um, things like that. Can be very helpful if you have, for example, um, you're trying to figure out, you know, how many of these CSS files are coming from a theme or a particular plugin. You can actually type the name of that uh, plugin slug or theme slug, and it'll narrow that list down to things that are coming from that, typically, uh, unless things happen to have the same name. <laughs> um, if you click on a specific item, it'll pull up more details on the right hand side here. So here we click on the google.com page load and we can see that uh, you know the status code and a lot of that stuff as well as the <clears throat> response headers, the security headers and things that were um, that were sent. Uh, so you get to see a lot of that kind of detail. Um, one little hint, uh, caching can be a little bit of a problem a lot when you're working as a developer. So in this network panel, you, there's a checkbox to disable the cache. And um, if you disable the cache, that will prevent caching. Uh, so you will avoid a lot of the, um, the need to do cache busting um, when you're dealing with um, your WordPress theme development. Um, so the other thing that we have here is a preserve log. So one of the things that you run into is you'll go to a page and then it redirects you somewhere else. And you're trying to figure out, you know, well, what redirected me? Like, why? <laughs> what did I get? How many times did I get redirected? Was it just once? Did I? Is this some sort of loop? Um, all of these kinds of things. So you can you could check this preserved log, and then you can go to a particular page where you're expecting a redirect. If you filter by doc, it will show you the list of um, files that were loaded, and then um, you know it'll give you a way to trace, you know, this thing redirected from non-HTTP to HTTPS, and then it redirected from this path to that path or something like that. Um, a little helpful hint, if WordPress itself is doing a redirect, you can actually click on the file and it will show you in the headers, um, you know, redirected by WordPress. Uh, there's a header for that. So let's see. So this is um, another cool, helpful hint. Um, 
let's say you're trying to test form submissions and making sure the data gets passed along. Um, you can actually uh, see all of the data that was posted in a form. Uh, so again, typically I'll do the preserve log, especially if there's some sort of redirect, like in this case, it redirected me from the form I filled out to um, a thanks for getting in touch. And then, you know, here it has another form, which is for subscribing. So, um, so there's a redirect, um, but you preserve the log, fill out the form, you hit submit, and then uh, you can actually click on the, the post request. And then it will show you, whoops, it'll show you the list of form data. So here we can see I input, you know, name, email, uh, message, all of these things. Um, so that's very helpful. Uh, user agent spoofing. So I've had situations in the past where um, people said that their site loaded fine and everything was great, except they were noticing in Google search results that you know, you know, things are a little odd. Uh, and so what can happen sometimes if your site gets hacked, for example, um, there are scripts out there that will check the user agent. And if the user agent's Google bot, uh, meaning that Google is coming to see what's on the page and that's what's going to get indexed, it will um, actually completely feed, feed it a different page than the actual page. So if you go there as an individual user, you don't have that Googlebot user agent, <clears throat> so you get a normal page. But Googlebot is getting all this trash and it's just messing with your SEO, right? So you can actually test this with the um, user agent spoofing. So you can go to more tools, network conditions, and then there's this user agent and you can select the Googlebot. And then when you reload the page, it will uh, load it as Googlebot. And so if there is some weird thing going on with user agents, uh, you can see that. Another cool feature is if you're doing some sort of Ajax stuff, for example, in WordPress, you can actually replay a particular Ajax request. So let's say you're doing like an Ajax form submission and you're trying to handle the submission on the back end. And, um, you know, you don't want to have to fill out the form every single time just to test stuff on the back end, right? <clears throat> you can fill out the form once, have it trigger the Ajax call, and then you can right click on the uh, you know, if you filter by fetch slash, slash XHR, it will show you all of the Ajax requests that are being made. And you can right click on one and just hit replay and it will re-perform that action. So that gives you an easy way to say, right click replay. Then you can test your thing on the back end. Oh, I got to tweak something, replay it, check it again till you get it right. Uh, save you a lot of time. Uh, so another thing is security, right? So working with certificates. So um, there is a security tab and you can click on that and it will give you details about the security of the page that you're on. Uh, so if you have a, I don't know, a client site or something where you're trying to figure out, you know, why a particular page isn't fully secure, uh, this will tell you all the reasons. You can also validate, you know, like, what is the certificate? You know, where is it from? Uh, is it a Let's Encrypt or something like that? Uh, you can hit the View Certificate and it'll pop up a little window here and you can see all the details of that. Another helpful thing if you are just dealing with um, HTTPS issues is you can go to whynopadlock.com. It'll also do a similar thing, but uh, you can actually get a lot of that same feedback right here in the browser from the security tab. All right, so here's one of the fun ones. So this is where you start to work with files local on your machine um, within the browser and having those things persist. So here's an example. So this is the uh, Bluehost Site Migrator plugin. Uh, so here, what we have is we're using SAS. So SAS gets converted into CSS and CSS is what's actually used in the browser. Um, but what you can do is you can go to the sources panel and click on file system, and then you can add a particular folder to the workspace. So what that means is that all my SAS files are added into this workspace. So I can click on one and I can actually edit a SAS variable and save it 
And then what's going to happen behind the scenes is whatever tool I'm using to build my CSS happens. And then I can just refresh the page and all of that will show up here. So I don't have to jump back and forth between my editor and the browser. I can actually have the editor in the browser and manipulate files that way. So that's one great way to, you know, to work. Uh, <clears throat> you can also persist uh, changes in another way. So there's something called overrides. So if you go into overrides and then you, um, <clears throat> you know, select a folder, it doesn't really matter what the folder is. You just need a folder. Uh, it'll, for each site that you want to override, it'll create a new folder inside of that for the site. Um, so you'll select that. And then up here at the top, it'll say, are you sure you want to um, give permission to whatever that path is? And you'll just hit the allow button. And then uh, you'll make some sort of change in the browser, uh, which of course might be CSS here. And that CSS would affect what you see here. <clears throat> and then what happens is it basically saves your changes to that file into that overrides folder. So when you reload the page, all of the changes that you made are still there, right? And of course, you can, there's a toggle button. You can enable and disable all those overrides quickly if you want to just go back to the way it was. Um, but this gives you a, a nice way of working with um, a file that you can actually manipulate on your computer that will impact the, um, the page load. And of course, if you want to undo an override, you could just right click on it and delete it. And that will uh, that will remove it as well. Uh, so here, this is a feature that a lot of people are not as familiar with. Um, so I wanted to bring it up because I think it's very, very helpful, especially as a developer, especially as developers communicating with developers is great. But I think even if you showed a client how to do this, they could create a recording and send it to you. And this could be a better way for people to share ways of reproducing issues on a site, uh, for example. So um, so if you open up DevTools and you go to the Recorder tab, and this is a experimental, but you should see it uh, by default. So there's a Recorder tab. And then uh, there's a button here called Start a New Recording. So you can click Start a New Recording. And then what will happen is it'll say, OK, give it a name. So you give it a name, and, you, and you'll have this little Record button down here, and you'll hit Start. And once you do that, um, any actions that you do over in the left are going to get recorded. So here we can see that we went to Google. Um, we clicked on the search box. We changed the text in the search box. We did a key down event, which is probably uh, enter, right? Uh, and then it um, it changed, you know, showed us the results, and then. Um, you know, we click on that and then it took us to this page. So all of those events got captured um, as this single recording. So then you can just hit replay and it'll do it over and over. So if you, um, for example, if you made some changes to the page and want to make sure it still worked the same, but there were multiple steps involved, like filling out an entire form, you could actually just record that and then just hit replay. <clears throat> and it would be the same as you manually doing all that stuff again. Um, so it's a good way to kind of, run a basic test, um, but you can also export and import replays. So <clears throat> this little import export buttons up here, you can actually export as a JSON file, which means you can share that with somebody else who can then import it in the same place. And then what will happen is they can click replay and it will perform all those same actions. So, um, so it's possible for someone to do something on a site record it, pass it off to a developer, and the developer can say, ah, okay, I see exactly what they did. And they don't have to write some super long description of, you know, I went here, I did that, I clicked on this thing, um, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, the other cool thing, uh, if you happen to use Cypress, is there is a Chrome extension called the Chrome Cypress Recorder. And that will actually allow you to export any actions that you do manually <clears throat> as a Cypress test script. So that will actually allow you to um, save that test into your project. And then you can automate running that um, 
as part of your CI CD flow. Um, so a few performance notes. Um, there is a tool called Lighthouse, which has a tab in the developer tools called Lighthouse, where you can do different types of audits. So we have a performance audit. Um, there are also some other like SEO, best practices, accessibility, um, and other types of audits as well. Um, but in this case, um, typically I'll run these performance audits on mobile because it gives you worse scores on mobile than you get on desktop usually. So if you fix mobile, you've basically fixed both. Um, <clears throat> so you'll click the analyze page load button. It'll reload the page and analyze it. Oddly enough, Google's homepage got a 68 um, when I went to go uh, test it. Um, side note, when you run these Lighthouse tests, try to do it as a guest in Chrome instead of uh, your normal um, you know, user profile, because a lot of times your user profile has different Chrome extensions enabled. And as a guest, uh, all, all of those are turned off and they potentially can impact the scores that you're seeing when you run these tests. So <clears throat> if you run it from, from the guest window, you'll get more appropriate results. Um, but yeah, so it tells you, it gives you a score and these are the uh, core web metrics that Google tracks here. Uh, so you see we're green on two of them and then red on four. And then uh, then down here at the bottom, it uh, it tells you the opportunities uh, associated with it. You could run this from incognito as well, but, but it is possible. Like I actually have a couple of extensions enabled in incognito mode. So for me, it's actually easier to go to the guest, the guest window and run them from there. Um, but if you don't have any extensions enabled in incognito, that's a that's a good way to do it. Um, so you can uh, see the list at the bottom. It, you'd have to scroll to see the rest, but it it gives you a priority list from top to bottom of the things that are affecting performance the most. So if you start at the top and work your way down, <clears throat> you're going to make the biggest performance jumps uh, initially, and then you kind of fine tune as you go uh, to get you know those those smaller incremental improvements. Uh, <clears throat> Another cool tool is there's a performance insights tab. Um, it's very similar to the performance tab. I think it's just a little less data overload. Um, <laughs> so this is still an experimental thing, but uh, you know it should should be there by default. Uh, so you'll click the measure page load, and this will actually um, give you a lot more detail, and it'll show you some of the core web metric uh, things here. And uh, you can actually click on those and see specifically uh, you know what elements for example are affecting the largest contentful paint so a lot of times it's just kind of a question mark like oh I see that I don't have a good score on this but I don't know what's the cause uh, this is a way that you can easily find one or multiple elements that are affecting you know that particular score um, so in this case, you know, we're actually doing really good on the largest contentful paint, but the thing that's affecting it the most is the, the image here. Um, <clears throat> so likewise with accessibility, like I said, there are lighthouse audits for multiple things. <clears throat> and uh, so we can hit analyze page load again. Uh, interestingly, Google's homepage also gets an 80 for accessibility. Um, so there's a, a number of things here that you know, it says that they should do differently. Uh, so obviously, you know, you'd want to go through and address those things. Um, there is also, if you're in the elements panel, there is on the right-hand side where you normally would see your styles, you can switch over to the accessibility tab. So then you can click on an element and this will actually show you information about that element in relation to the greater document. So, It'll tell you if there's any specific ARIA attributes associated with the element or things that you know are related to accessibility in some way. And it'll show you the entire, what we call the accessibility tree, which is, you know, there, there's sometimes there's certain elements that have particular roles that only work right if they're inside of something else. Um, so being able to see the relationship there and how all that kind of comes together, um, you can do that pretty easily from here. Um, another thing you can do, which is actually really fun, 
is to emulate vision deficiencies inside of Chrome. So <clears throat> you can actually emulate blurred vision, <laughs> uh, which we're mainly going to focus on uh, color blindness. So seeing your sight from somebody's eyes who are colorblind. So you can actually um, hit Command Shift P when you're in DevTools, anywhere in DevTools, and it will pull up the command menu. And the command menu will allow you to type uh, something in. <clears throat> and uh, so there's, what is it? A chromatopsia, dura, Nopia and protonopia uh, and tridonopia. Uh, so I found if you just type atopia <laughs> into the uh, box, it'll it'll narrow that down just to all the uh, you know colorblind visual deficiency. Um, so you can click on one, and it will emulate. So you can see the colors if we go back one. So you know we got our nice green and red and yellow, and when we switch over, you know it kind of dims all that down. Uh, to emulate this visual deficiency. So um, very cool. Um, once you do that, next question you're going to run into is, how do I undo it? <laughs> uh, you undo it the same way, Command-Shift-P, and you'll type vision, and it'll give you an option, do not emulate any vision deficiency, and that'll return everything back to normal. So um, and as you can see, there's this emulate blurred vision here too. Um, a lot of designers will actually use that to just to, to lose focus on any one thing and, and see if the page flow makes sense and things like that. Um, so dealing with cookies, cookies and data. So <clears throat> in the application panel in DevTools, there is a section here under storage on the left where it says cookies, and it'll show you for the given URLs that you have cookies for, um, in this case for Google, um, it'll show you the list of cookies. And you can actually edit or add or remove or um, delete cookies um, individually and change values individually here if you like. Um, so if you're doing something that involves cookies, you can manipulate those as needed. Um, there's also local storage. So if you're doing something with local storage, uh, you can see all those values and manipulate those here as well. And then uh, a little more helpful, uh, you know, a lot of times we, we say, oh, we got to clear the browser cache. Well, you know, you go clear your browser cache, you're clearing it for everything. Um, you know, sometimes you want to clear cookies, but you don't want to clear all your cookies, right? Uh, you really just want to clear stuff for a single site. So when you're on a site, like here, I'm on Google, go to the application tab. Uh, under application here on this left panel, there's a storage uh, item, you click on that, there's this clear site data button, and it will clear all of the data, that's cookies and local storage and all these other things uh, associated with just that site. So that's a better way of clearing cache for a particular thing um, without having to mass trash all of your um, you know, cache data and stuff. Uh, a few bonus features. <clears throat> uh, so sometimes you're looking for something and you have no idea where it is. Is it in the HTML? Is it in the JavaScript? Is there something in the CSS that, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't know where it is. You don't know even what kind of file it is in. Um, you can go to the elements panel. Uh, you can click on, actually, I think you do this for anywhere. You can go to the dot, dot, dot menu, more tools, and then search. And then this will do essentially a search across all of the files and things that get loaded inside of um, the WordPress site or whatever site you're working on. And um, so you can just type, in this case, we type Google. <laughs> uh, and this shows us all the files that Google's website has loaded that have the word Google in it. Um, so obviously you will probably have something specific you're looking for that would be a little bit more refined, but um, it is possible to search everything uh, pretty easily. So another thing is, um, let's see, uh, just noticing a note here. When you click your profile pick, you'll see other profiles at the bottom where you can add or select guests, yeah. So yeah, so like up here where you have your little avatar, if you click on that, it should give you a drop down at least that gives you like a guest option. Um, but you know, people who have 
I don't know, multiple Google accounts or something like that. They can toggle between them. Um, sometimes you're doing something and you realize that you just triggered some JavaScript code or something that's going to cause an infinite loop and you realize it's going to crash your browser and you just want to like go ahead and kill it before it gets too out of hand and starts to slow your computer down. Um, you can actually go to the window uh, option here and there is a task manager uh, menu item. So you click on task manager, it'll pull up the task manager and show you all of the things that are running within essentially the browser. Um, and it'll show you the memory usage and the CPU usage for those particular things. So you can find the culprit that's uh, affecting you know, the performance of your browser. And then you can click it. And then down in the bottom right, there's a button called in process. And so if you click on that, it will kill that browser tab. Um, so that way you don't have to sit and wait for it to time out and then Google to detect that it's not doing what it's supposed to. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is kind of the last and final big tip here and we're getting close to time, but um, so there's something called a HAR file. The HAR file stands for HTTP archive. So there's so much stuff in the dev tools that you can give you a lot of information. Um, and sometimes, you know, you're not the professional when it comes to like diagnosing like specific issues or any of that kind of stuff. And so sometimes what you want to do is you just want to say, hey, I ran into this weird issue. I want to send my developer or whatever, all the information or another developer that's more experienced, all the information um, associated with what I'm looking at. Um, and you can do that with a HAR file. So the HAR file actually collects all the data that you see in developer tools, packages it up into a file. You could ship that file off um, so, you, so you can export it using the little export button. And then somebody else can import it and it will actually load up the page with the exact uh, HTML and CSS and JavaScript. It doesn't even need internet connection. It'll just load it all in. And then you can actually explore all of the uh, HTTP requests and all of the um, you know, elements and all of the CSS and all of those different things, um, just as if you were that person who ran into that issue on that page. So it's great for diagnosing performance issues or really random things that only happen like once in a blue moon and somebody hit it, you can grab that. Um, <clears throat> but the one tip I will say, just from a security standpoint, again, if you're exporting hard files and sending them to somebody else, I recommend that you just do that from incognito window um, because it captures all the cookies and browser sessions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you want to kind of limit limit that by using incognito so you don't send too much information to somebody else. Um, but it but if you do it that way, it should be pretty safe. Um, yeah, so that is that is it. Uh, like I said. Uh, there's a lot of information here. So uh, it's really not so much um, about, you know, this is more of just to introduce a lot of the different concepts and things that you can do uh, and just send you off and say, hey, let's let's go explore. Um, <clears throat> so I do have uh, a list of uh, things here. I'm gonna, like I said, get the slides, post them on the meetup page. Uh, so kind of check that. Uh, after the fact, and all of this will be here with all the links to all these little great, uh, great tools. Um, so some of these are additional things that I know I had no time to get to, but some of these are other things that uh, are just more generally helpful or more official documentation that go into greater depth on on these things. So uh, hopefully you found it helpful. And uh, if you do have follow-up questions or anything like that, you can ask on the meetup page or you can go to my website, wpscholar.com and send me a message through the contact form. So uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody coming out and I guess we can go ahead and stop the video.